chapter, um, chapter two, and we're going to read at, let's, let's read at the eighth verse. The Bible says that the voice, the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. So he's making a journey. He's skipping on the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young heart. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows and he is gazing through the lattice. Y'all know what lattice is. It's like that, that, that square and that picket fence kind of like thing. He's, he's, he's looking through the windows and he's gazing, gazing through the lattice. So there is distance. It's a wall possibly that keeps us distant. My beloved spake, spoke. And he said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Somebody say, rise up, rise up. And, come away. and come away. Those are, if you, if you have a real Bible, if you want to, you want to use your, whatever you used on your iPhone or your iPad, whatever it is, I want you to highlight those words, rise up and come away. So there's a process in the connection. You understand? Her beloved is he's coming, he's made the journey. But there's still something between them. And she has to rise up. He has to, the worshiper has to rise up and make a decision to come away. Yeah. Psalms 28. That's where I want to go to. And we are going to read one verse, Psalms 28 and verse 7. 28 and verse 7. The Lord is my strength and he's my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. And with not your song or not their song or not the latest song, but with my song, I will praise him with my song. I want to talk for a few moments from the subject, the significance of a song. The significance of a song. Spirit of God, I thank you for this moment. I feel your presence. I thank you for what you've taught us in this series. And as we bring it to a close today, I pray, God, that you will continue to impact our lives. Speak to us clearly. Say whatever you want to say. I have an idea, but Lord, it's just an idea of what you want to say. Take over the room, take over the audience, take over the speaker and say whatever the Spirit wants to say. And when we leave here, may we know beyond the shadow of any doubt that we have heard from you just one word from the Lord. We thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated on your way down. Tell somebody the significance of a song. significance of a song you you really cannot hardly you can't talk about worship and do a series about worship and do messages about worship and and not bring up the name of David because David was a real worshiper um, and what's so cool about the Bible is that every time you see the name David we're talking about the same David so it's not like you're having to decipher, was it this David or was it another David? No, he's, he's the David. He is mentioned nearly uh, 800 times in the Old Testament. And he's mentioned about 70 times in the New Testament. Worship, 
was what I, what I found out with him is that worship was not something that he just did. Occasionally worship was how he lived. Worship was a lifestyle to David. It was a decision that he made. And he made that decision to not just talk about worship or tell people to worship. Have you ever been at the mercy of worship leaders who all they did was harp and tell you, you need to worship. And you're looking at them like, if you would worship, I might just follow you right on in. But sometimes people get so busy telling people to do it that they don't do that themselves. But in order to live the life of a real worshiper, uh, you have to get to the, the point where you become more and more God conscious and less and less self conscious. A lot of people don't worship because they're so self conscious. Well, what if I raise my hand the wrong way? And what if somebody happens to look at me when I put my hand up? So we've got all of this self. Well, I just don't do it like that. Pastor Brady, that's not me. That's not who I am. Y'all go ahead. I'll just wait. But wait a minute. This is not about you. This is about him. It's about what he wants. Tell somebody, give the man what he wants. Put my mic back, if you will, like it was. Uh, give the man what he wants. So David, he, even though he was a man and he knew who he was, he knew he was Israel's king. But he also knew that before he was Israel's king, he was God's worshiper. And the, uh, the, the thing that has always impressed me about David is that even though he was a king, he didn't care about rank uh, when it came to worship. He, 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 one of us, I don't know, I don't even know if it was me or Pastor Joseph or Pastor Travis or Pastor Chris, somebody uh, was talking about David and how, and maybe it was me, I think it might have been me. He was, <laughs> it, it might have been me, I don't know. Uh, but he was, how he was bringing the ark back. And how he got to the place and his wife, Michael, she was watching outside of the window and she was humiliated because he was going so crazy in worship. And he ended up stripping off his clothes and he was in the street worshiping with common people. And here he is, the king. She was totally insulted and, and just thought it was horrible because she would have never seen her father, who was Saul, worship like that. And so... But what I loved about David, and as I still do as I think about it, he only cared about rank on the battlefield. When it came time for battle, that is when he cared about rank. But when it came time for worship, he said, I am one of y'all. And I am a worshiper. And he would, he would use his words so articulately. I, I, I love that about him because he could talk his way right straight up into the heart of God. Even when God was, was upset with him, he could still talk his way into the... He had a way with words. And he not only talked, but he sang his way into the presence of God. Many, uh, he, he, he's had many titles, but one of his titles is the sweet singer of Israel or the sweet psalmist of Israel. As a matter of fact, there was not a prophet, there wasn't a priest, there wasn't a king in all of Israel's history that was more involved with musical expression uh, when it comes to worship than David was. He was the first. David had the ability to release his innermost thoughts and his innermost feelings, and he could do that through a song. David had a way of saying stuff that would make you be like, that is exactly what I'm trying to say. You ever been around somebody and they talk and you're like, that's what I mean. I mean, I, I didn't have the way to, to articulate that, but I get that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Well, so that was David. David knew how to articulate things to God. He said, Lord, how? When he was in a pressing time, he said, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be that say of my soul, there is no hope for him in God. And then he pauses and he says, but thou, O oh Lord, you're a shield for me. Me. And you are the glory and you are the lifter of my head. Psalm after psalm after psalm was written by the psalmist David. When music is anointed, it releases 
miracles. It releases the miraculous. When, word, when music is anointed, it releases fear. It releases anxiety. It releases torment and tension and anger and frustration. How do you know? Because I've walked into the middle of it many a time. And as I walked into it, I could feel things snapping and breaking because I might have came frustrated. But just getting into the atmosphere... Of, a, of anointed music, and, and not just music, but singers, as, as, as minstrels begin to play, and as singers begin to sing, yokes, and burdens, and bondages, and habits, and chains, and fetters, and strongholds, they can shatter in that kind of atmosphere, and David knew the power that comes when people worship God musically. He knew that the the power, uh, th there was a measure of power that was released as people would sing together. And David, therefore, he had a song for every occasion in his life. In happy times, he would sing things like, my soul shall be joyful in the Lord, and it shall, my soul shall rejoice in his salvation. In times of uncertainty, David would say, my heart is steadfast, oh God, I will sing and I will give praise to you. In troubled times, he would say, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength, and he is is their help in the time of trouble. When things got completely unstable, he would say, cast your burden on the Lord, for he shall sustain you. He shall never, somebody say never. never. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. When he needed direction, he said, for the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So David had a song for every different season that he found himself in. He had a song while he was running from the king who was Saul at that time. And then he also had a song once he became the king. And if he didn't have one, he wrote one. I said, if he didn't have one, he wrote one. We have no historic record of professional musicians before the time of David. Up until his day, much of the music that happened in the gatherings was done by, uh, most of it was done by women. It was Miriam who led the women in singing and in dancing when the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea. She picked up her tambourine and began to celebrate and the women celebrated with her. But when David came on the scene, David led men to express their innermost feelings to God through music. Of the 38,000 Levites that he chose to serve in the temple, 4,000 were minstrels. 4,000 were musicians. Can you imagine? I think we might have to hire a few more. <laughs> David was the one that established formal music in worship. He founded musical schools under the, the, the presidency of Asaph. He appointed choirs. I want a choir here. I want, a, I, I want an orchestra there. He employed full-time music directors to service the tabernacle of David. Why did he do that? Because he learned that, he, and he learned early in life, that there was an anointing and there was a power that you could get of God to sit down on music. He learned that personally first. He was, he was what they would call the court musician when Saul was king. And when Saul was absolutely tormented by evil spirits, it was David that they would call. Somebody get that young boy, David. Tell him to come in here and start pick up, pick up his harp and start playing. And as he would play, the atmosphere would change. Because anointed music, musicians change the atmosphere. 
He watched Saul as he would go from being tormented to becoming tender in his spirit uh, because I don't care how tough that you or I may be, uh, God, his anointing and his power has a way of breaking every last one of us down. David used music to calm people. He used music to inspire them to respond to God. Look at somebody and say, respond to God. He, he used music to help people to respond to God. Over 70 times, he used the word sing. And most of those times, it was in the form of a command. It was not a suggestion. Being a student of, of human nature, he knew that, that it could be difficult to gird up the thoughts of your mind at any given moment and completely focus on God. So he called for us to sing. Why? Because he knew that the song is what could bridge the gap between the pressures of life and the pleasures of worship. It is a song that gets between the pressures of life and the pleasures of worship. He knew that the song would be your fire escape. It, when life got too hard and when life begins to, to burn you up, it is your song that becomes your way of escape. How many know what I'm talking about? Have you ever felt like you were in a, your life was on fire, your house was on fire, your marriage was on fire, but if you could just get in your car and drive and sing the song of God, it would create an exit for you, an exit that wasn't even there, but now the exit is there. Why? Because of our song. Yes. Worship has been like therapy to me. When I was coming up in church, you didn't have therapists. You, and people preached against all of that. Mm, it was craziness. They pe preached against all of that. Uh, but I think a lot of people need therapists today. Okay? I ain't mad at therapists. I, I, I have one. I need one. You might need one. It's Okay? Because therapy can be redeeming and it can be salvaging and it can be rehabilitating and it can be restorative. Look at somebody and say, I must worship. No, I don't think they understand. Look at them and tell them, no, I'm telling you, I must. You might not like me if I don't worship, okay? I will be a different person. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I must worship. The hour has come and now is. The Bible says that they that worship must worship. That means it's essential for me, okay? I, I'm better. I'm better. I'm a better mother when I worship. I'm a better wife when I worship. I'm a better leader, a better pastor, a better preacher, a better whatever it is. I must worship. How about I'm just a better human after I Worship. Now, don't y'all go out of here and get in a fight in a parking lot because you just worship. Truly, though, I feel like I'm sane today. Uh, whatever measure I'm, I have sanity, it is because of the therapy of worship and being in the presence of God. Worship is a part of what pulled my mind back together on countless occasions. Worship is the reason that I refuse to be bitter. Worship is the reason that I refuse to walk around with unforgiveness. Worship flushes all of that out of you. Come on, y'all know what I'm telling the truth today. That's, that's why I can't come into the house of God acting all bougie and all special and all professional. Because I remember the nights that I laid in my bed crying and groaning and tears running down my face until the Holy Ghost moved in and pushed back powers and he pushed back principalities and saying, that's it, that's enough, enough is enough. Loose her mind, loose her anxiety. Oh, you, you know, you've come as far as you're coming and in my name I back you up, devil. That's God coming in, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost in you will fight for you give her her peace back press down shake up. you're a thief and I caught you give it back to her sevenfold her joy give her joy back give her victory back give her her hope back and when the enemy came in like a flood the spirit of the 
Lord raised up a standard and that's why I praise him and that's why it is an optional for me God did for me what nobody would do for me and you can sit up here and act like he didn't do it for you if you want to but I will bless the Lord because I know who did it for me and there's no way in the world there's no way in the world that you can think about his faithfulness to you and you not worship if you give it any kind even a little bit of a thought something breaks out in your spirit because when you start thinking of God and how many times he showed up for you when people didn't show up for you you will do something I said you will do something something we don't all sing we don't all dance we don't all get loud but I'm gonna tell you something we are instructed in Romans 12 and 1 present your body a lit not a dead sacrifice sometimes you come in we don't know if you're dead or alive you dead today but he wants a living your body, your body, your body, your hands, your feet, your mouth. Present it. It's a present to him. Wrap a bow on it and say, God, you're worthy of it all. But if you dare, if you come in like you are dead, I'm telling you, if you'll think of the goodness of Jesus and what he's done for you, something will make you say, God, I thank you. And when you start reminding yourself of all that he has been, all that he is, and all that he will yet be, you will somehow find a way to respond to his faithfulness. Your little lips, yes, whatever. It, it, something will come and you'll utter something out of your lips. Oh, I, I know you're quiet and I know, I know oh, I'm, I'm bashful. I'm shy. I'm, I'm conservative. I'm self-conscious. But there is something. There is a thing that God can do for you that will produce a praise or a cry or a Thank you, Jesus, that refuses to be quiet. I'm telling you, there is a praise. When God gets through making a way where there seemed to be no way, when he gets through being your mighty counselor, your provider, your shield, your defender, the God that fights for you, when he gets through wiping the tears from your eyes and calming your nerves down, when he gets through giving you the house and the job and the favor, when he gets through taking care of you, there is something in you that makes you say oh let me just say when the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead yanks your life up it won't matter what you're going through you will lay it all aside and say I'm coming out of this I know I know what victory in the making feels like you will praise God until even the devil is going to wonder what does she know that I don't know you'll praise Praise him because you know that God in your trouble surrounded you with songs of deliverance. And had he not done that, you or I might not have been here today. But in between you and fear, God slipped a song. In between you and poverty, he slipped a song. In between you and depression, he put a song. In between you and your enemies, you came to church and you sat down next to somebody. You couldn't even sing one yourself, but he put a song close to you. You could hear it on both sides of you. Oh, when those that wanted you dead were trying to get you, God put a song of delay, a shield, a song, a storm, whatever in your storm, he put a song of deliverance in the face of your diagnosis he stuck a song in the face of abuse he put a song there why because there is deliverance in singing your song sometimes sometimes sinners are arrested through a song quicker than they are through the preaching of the word that, that, that's true. 
because there is something about music that reaches into the soul of mankind. It reaches deep into the soul of mankind. Sometimes just listening to another person sing can reduce you to tears. It might even just be on the radio. It might be a recording. But you hear it, and all of a sudden something breaks in you. Something that you knew needed to break, but you felt like you couldn't get a breakthrough. And when they sing, all of a sudden, next thing you know, you move from just listening to participating. Some of you come to church, and for the first minute or two, you're just listening. But as you hear everybody else begin to sing, you start participating in the song. David wasn't much for what we would call maybe a preacher today, but he could move his listeners with a song. Faith can be rekindled by a song. Hope and courage is rekindled by a song. Uh, uh, contact with God and your relationship with him can be rekindled by a song. Look at somebody and tell them whatever you do, don't lose your song. Israel, think about it. Israel came out of Egypt with a song. Israel came through the wilderness with a song. David lived for years in the land of the Philistines, surrounded by their idol gods, but he kept his song in the midst of all of the idolatry, and he ended up conquering the very ones that were in there because he refused to hang his harp on the willow tree and just say, I'm just going to be like they are. It's just easier to be like like they are. No, instead he played his harp and he sang and he conquered the enemy with a song. Is there an enemy that you could sit up in your bed at night, lift up your voice loudly, even if you can't carry a tune, just start wailing and singing and God causing your enemy to fall at your right hand and fall at your left hand. David taught through a song. He taught Israel that their God was not like every other God. He, didn't, he taught them this. Your, our God is not like the God, uh, that, 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 that the heathen gods that are surrounding nations. For the Lord, our God, is a great God. And he is greatly to be praised. He is feared and he is above. We sing about it today. He is above all gods. He taught them that honor and majesty uh, are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Look at somebody and tell him you sit next to beauty today. <laughs> the, he taught them he taught them that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those that dwell therein. He taught them the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. But then he turned around and he taught them. But he is near to those who are of a broken heart. He taught a balanced concept of God and, through, and he did it through a variety of songs that he wrote for Israel to sing. David knew that the more people would sing about God, the more they would come to know him. Most, and, and I think that's true, most of what I initially learned about God, I didn't learn from the Bible. I didn't learn from the preacher. I learned from the song service. And as people began to sing, they would tell the story. You have heard of little Moses in the bulrush. You have heard of fearless David and his sling. You have heard the story told of dreaming Joseph and of Jonah and the well you often sing. That's the kind of songs I had to learn. But anyway, I learned them. I learned them. And I learned all about that before I ever opened the Bible and began to study about those characters. And so I, I learned from the song. Singing requires hearing. Hello, singing requires hearing, it requires then, it requires learning, and then it requires repeating. Hearing, 
learning and repeating what you have learned. And truth that is sung becomes truth that is reinforced and ultimately it becomes truth that is remembered. Do I need to say that again? Truth that is sung becomes truth that is reinforced and then it becomes truth that is remembered. If you started singing all the songs you know, you might be shocked to know how much Bible you know because you got it out of a song, okay? That don't mean you shouldn't read your Bible. Let me make that very clear. You got to make it clear for folk today because folk will just say, oh yeah, I don't have, I just got to sing. That's all I know. David taught people how to shout. He said, shout for joy and be glad. He taught him, clap your hands, all ye people. He taught him, offer sacrifices. Therefore, I will offer the sacrifice of joy in the tabernacle. He taught them to sing, I will sing, he said. Yes, I will sing the praises of the Lord. He taught us that singing was a tool and, and, and that we should maximize that tool to the best of our ability. See, l listen, the desire to worship is in all of us. Yeah. It matters what we worship. Yeah. We're all going to worship something, okay? It, it does you a whole lot better if you will worship a God that can help you as opposed to one that cannot. Uh, so we all have the desire, and it's not just women that have that desire. Men have that desire, okay? So male and female, we all have that instinctive need to worship. But the execution of that worship, for some people, it is difficult. I say it is difficult because here's something that happens. Worship demands that you get in touch with your innermost feelings, okay? Praise, you can, you can be drunk and run in here and holler and shout and not be in touch with your innermost feelings. Because the Bible said the only qualification to praise is let everything that has, right. Worship is completely different though, okay? Worship, you have to get up close. You have to get into the face of God. And so there has to be, there, your innermost, you've got to be in touch with your innermost feelings. And a lot of people are uncomfortable with getting in touch with their innermost feeling. It also requires that we put our feelings into words. And not everybody is gifted at putting their feelings into words. You remember when when you were dating or those of you that are dating and, and you like you heard a song on the radio and you and him or you and her or, or whatever y'all y'all knew that's our song that's our song that's our jam right there you knew that why because that song said things that you didn't have the ability to articulate okay but words to the worshiper is what hammers and nails are to a carpenter. Words are a part of your toolbox. Words will broaden things. Words will intensify things. Words will enlarge and open up things. Words will add fuel to the fire. Are y'all hearing me today? I often say, I often tell you, look for ways to, to, to say the same word in many, different, uh, in, in many different ways. Because I say, you can say, I love you. I love you. I love you, God. I love you, God. Or you can say, I adore you and I'm passionate about you. Oh, God, I'm infatuated by you. You enamor me. I esteem you, oh, God. I exalt you. I treasure you. You are the apple of my eye. Ooh, and you could say, God, you've been, a, you've been water in a dry place. When I was in a dry place, you were water to me. You were a well springing up to me into everlasting life. You are a rock when I find myself in a weary land. You are strength when I'm weak. You're bread when I'm hungry. You are water when I'm thirsty. You are so beautiful to me. All of those are ways of saying, I love you, Lord. And I'm taking it to the next level. Why? Because if you don't take love to the next level, love becomes stale. And nobody's saying nothing back right there. Look at somebody say, keep it fresh. Here's what I want you to think about. 
think of it like this. Worship, worship, um, levels of worship. I, I want you to say, I want you to think of it as this. Worship has rooms, okay? Worship has rooms. And words are the keys that unlock the door that lets you into the room. Oh, are y'all following me right now? How many of you know you've talked your way into rooms? Because you use your words. See, some people will never know what's behind door number three because they didn't use their keys to unlock door number two or door number one. Ooh, tell somebody, use your words. Your words are the keys. Your and, and listen, your expression to God, it needs to increase as your knowledge of God increases. Hello, it's, it's okay to say dada and mama when you are eight months old, but when you are 18, you should have some other kind of verbiage that you can use. And if you don't, it is a sign that you are deficient. I said it's a sign that there is a deficiency that is happening in your life. So instead of stopping with the Lord, uh, I thank you, I, I, I thank you. Say, God, I celebrate you. I honor you. I appreciate you. My appreciation of you goes up every day. You are God alone. You are God all by yourself. No God like you. God, there's no God beside you. You are a bright light in my darkest place. Lord, if it had not been for you, that was on my side I would have been swallowed up look at somebody and say plan for praise plan for praise you plan for lunch you plan for dinner some of y'all planning right now you plan on what clothes to wear you plan on vacation you plan on retirement you have got to plan on worship otherwise worship becomes stale and nobody wants to do it because it is stale worship should be a progression it should be an ascension as you know notice on this platform every Every Sunday, we do our best to make worship be an ascension, and every round goes higher, and every round goes higher. Worship should build. Worship should intensify. It is a crescendo. Worship should absolutely move. Song of Solomon said it today. My beloved spake and said unto me, rise up. Rise up, my love, my fair one. Rise up and come away. Real worshipers, rise up and come away. Woo. You can stand on the stage and say, there, that's, a, that's a real worshiper right there. Because they have rose up and they have left the building. Physically, they didn't leave the building. Their body is still there. But you can tell something about them has connected to the source of life. They don't care what we're saying. They don't care what we're singing. They don't care what's going on. I've connected. Rise up and come away. Look at somebody and tell them, you got to move up and you got to rise up. Look at somebody else and tell them, he's waiting on you in the spirit. Every Oh, every time you come in here, God is waiting on you in the spirit. Some of you never connect with him because you don't rise up and move. But if you understand that he's there and he is waiting on you, it is not good enough to come into the building if you do not rise up and come away. It's religious tradition and it makes the word of God of none effect. So you got to come away. Come Come away from rot. Come, come away from carnality. Come away from foolishness. Come away from your to-do list. Come away from who's here and who's not here. And what's that, what are they wearing? And what sh they should have added this to that outfit. Come away from the way you talk. Come away from the way you walk. Come away from the way you act. Come away from the way that you treat others. Your deliverance, your restoration, your destiny is waiting for you 
to rise up and to come away. God says, I ain't doing it all, okay? I am not doing it all. Hello? Look at somebody and tell him God wants you to meet him. God said, I ain't doing it all. I want you to meet me. I am in the spirit. I am right here. I want you to tap into that. And the only way that you can actually meet him is being willing to rise up and to come away. He's calling you to rise up and to come away. Why? Because he's got a blessing for you today. He wants to enlarge your territory. He wants to empower you. He wants to feed you. He wants to grow you. He wants to pour out out his anointing on you fresh and new behold he comes to me and he peers through the lattice I'm close but I've come this far now you got to come oh you're waiting for him to hit you like a freight train right stop that foolishness go meet him look at somebody say go meet him God says, I ain't doing it all, okay? I'm not going to do it all. There is a measure of responsibility that is on you to rise up and to come away. What you get out of a service depends on what you are willing to rise up and how much you're willing to rise up and how much you are willing to come away. What you get out of the service is based on how much you are willing to say I'm putting that thought down and I'm giving God preeminence in my thought and I am going, I'm moving. It's like an escalator. When you step on the escalator it takes you into places and you can look down and you can see where other people are or you can just focus and go higher and higher and higher Ooh, look at somebody and tell them you gotta move you gotta move you gotta move don't come in here sitting all still I loved it when I saw Nakia jump up out of her seat today and she ran down to this altar spinning it and turning it around let me tell you something you have got to move I know a real worshiper based on the way that they move you cannot sit there with your lips all sealed You're stale. You're stagnant. You're still same and uh, saying the same old things. You're doing the same old things. And you're, you're not looking for more keys so that you can up, open up more doors. I am going to look for keys. I'm going to find a key that fits that door that will take me to an opportunity to walk into that. Look at somebody tell them you got to keep it fresh. And a lot of people don't. And that's why when we say open your mouth and give him the best praise that you have, it's like a blanket falls. When, when the praise team and the worship leaders, when, when, they, when, they take, when they say open your mouth and sing your song. Mm. And uh, it's like a blanket falls on the room. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And hear me today. You run out of things to say when you're not used to talking to him. Woo, y'all like, y'all can't clap because I got you. Your nose is bleeding. I punched you in the face. Blood is everywhere. I got you right there. But David knew that if people would sing his songs, it would give them a ready-made vocabulary that they could use to worship the Lord. Go home and study the song of David. See if you can't find that ready-made vocabulary. David got people to sing individually because he did it himself. But then he brought them together and they began to sing corporately. Why did David work so hard to incorporate and to implement worship amongst the people of God? Because he knew that real worship challenges people. He knew that real worship changes people. He knew that real 
worship would put an edge on you to that you need to come through the class, to pass the test, to get the job, to have the courage to lead. Our worship should be so passionate that we draw nations with our worship. Singing is the tool. It was the tool for David, but transformation was the task. I said singing is the tool, but the reason we do that is so that we can be changed from glory to glory to glory. And when the people sang, God transformed them. And he does that to this very day. So when the enemy comes in to steal your song, hold on to it and sing louder than you have ever sang before. Sometimes all David had to give God was a song. When he failed, when he felt defeated, when he felt like the enemy was coming in like a flood, when they had him surrounded on all sides, all he could give God was a song. But when he gave him that song, he gave him everything that he had. How many times have you walked in here? And all you could give God was a song. But it was everything. And just cause you ain't jumping over there like they're jumping over here, does not give me the right to tell you that you ain't worshiping. Cause sometimes it's a praise all by itself for us to make it into the You know what I mean? The very fact that I'm here, God, is a praise to your name. And when David didn't have anything to give God but a song, he wasn't the slightest bit intimidated because he knew the power of a song. And he knew the power of praise and he knew the power of worship. He knew that worship had its own navigational system. And when you are a real worshiper, you don't even have to tell God where you are. But if you will just begin to worship, that navigational system will kick in and he will find you right where you are. In the middle of fear, in the middle of worry, in the middle of depression, in the middle of relationship issues. If you will worship, he will cause God to find you. And when he finds you, he will not leave you where you are, but he will navigate you out of that mess. Have you ever been lost? And if you hadn't had your GPS, you might not have known how to get out of the neighborhood that you found yourself in. But when you tapped into your GPS, when you tapped into your navigational system, it led you right out. Twists and turns and all. But it led you out of the mess that you had driven yourself into. He will navigate you through the storm with worship. He'll navigate you through the tempter's snare through worship. He'll navigate you out of your lowest lows with worship. He'll chart the course. He'll maneuver for you. He'll cross over some things. He'll sail you right through other things. And he'll talk to you every time you get to a turning point. If he ain't talking, don't turn. Woo, I wish that somebody who knew what I was talking about would thank him for being a speaking God. A God that will tell you, make a turn here. Stop, back up, go straight ahead. He does that for worshipers. David knew that wherever you were, in your faults, in your failures, in your poor decisions, he knew wherever you were that God would find you. And he knew all of these things personally. He knew them firsthand. He knew them because he'd experienced them. He knew if you're going into battle, the best way to go into battle is not going in Talking about, watch me bring down this Goliath. Hey guys, watch this, watch what I'm about to do. He did not say, hey, watch this, watch this, watch this. He didn't say, hey, check out my aim, watch. 
getting ready to bring that joker right now. He did not say, I got what it takes. So ju just watch, watch. He didn't say all that stuff. Because when you say that kind of crazy stuff, you disqualify your help, yourself from divine assistance. Oh, how many times have we disqualified ourselves thinking, I got this. If you ain't thinking, I got this in the name of Jesus, then you ain't thinking, and you ain't got it. When David went into battle, he said, you go in like this, you go in praising. You go in saying, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this big old Philistine that's standing up in my taste. That's why God showed up for David, because David bragged on God. Look at somebody and tell him, you got to brag on God, not just in here. You got to brag on God out there. David bragged on God. He spoke well of God. You've got to speak well of God. Even when you're in troubled times, you've got to stand there and say, my anchor, it will hold. I know that my anchor will hold. We might toss a little. We might go a little to the right and a little to the left. But devil, at the end of the day, my anchor is going to hold. My anchor, tell somebody, my anchor will hold. I got a little bit of trouble, but trust me on this. My anchor will hold, because I'm not anchoring in myself. My anchor grips the solid. Y'all ought to grab like you're holding on. Tell the devil, I'm going to hold on. You watch and see if I don't hold on. Ooh, the devil hates saints that know how to hold on. Look at somebody and tell them to hold on. While you're rocking, hold on. While you're shaking, hold on. While you're crying, hold on. Oh, and tell the devil, if I'm going to faint, it certainly ain't going to be over some kind of stupid reason like this. No, absolutely not. I'm too tough for that in the name of Jesus. This is who we are. We are the body of Christ. We are tough. And this is what we do. We will eat up our enemies like they are candy. You hear me? We will eat up our apostolic fathers and mothers taught us to hold on. There is a gut-wrenching experience that you will never get in God until you learn how to Tell somebody, grab hold of him and never let go. No matter what it is, no matter what you're facing, if you'll praise him in it, he'll pull you out of it. I said if you'll praise him in it, he'll pull you out of it. And the good news is this. This little trouble that you're facing is measured. Look at somebody and tell them, don't be discouraged. Because what you're facing is measured. God has already measured how much you can handle. And no matter how much your enemy wants you to bear, there is a load limit. Because of the goodness of God, there is a load left. God said, send this to Cheryl. She can handle that. Send this to her. S send this to Job. Send this to Paul. Wait a minute, don't send what I said goes to Paul to Cheryl, because she ain't ready for that. He knows exactly how much you can take. So rest assured, it might feel like it's going to break you down. But that tells me that he knows my frame. And he knows how much I can take. And he will help me to bear what I need to bear. So when people look at you and they feel sorry for you, 
Tell them, don't feel sorry for me. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, or anything coming my way has the ability to separate me from the love of God in Christ. I am persuaded. That means I know. That means I am convinced. Can I tell you, God's school is not a school of feelings. God's school is a school of knowledge because sometimes you gotta know even if you can't feel. Look at somebody and say, get knowledge. I know we like what we feel, but we got to get knowledge. Because you can't build your life on feelings. I said you can't build your life on feelings. You gotta build it on knowledge. It's the things that you know about God that will cause you to defeat every enemy that jumps up in your, not the things you heard, not the things you've seen, but it is the things that I know about. Look at your neighbor say, I know some things about God. I know he's able. I know he's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. I know he's steadfast. I know he may not come when I want him. But I know he's on time. When you know God for yourself, once you know him like that, you can go through anything. He gives you the grace to go through and still sing your Taking chemo, but you're singing. Even when they want you to shut your mouth, you can sing in your own spirit, hymns, songs, making melodies. Look at somebody tell them, you can't stop my song. You can seal up my lips, but you will never stop my. Why? Because I'm more than a conqueror. A conqueror is one who praises God when all is well. But a more than conqueror is somebody that prays when all things feel like they're going to hell in a handbasket. So when the devil starts saying, let's just call it. Let's just call it this. Push your neighbor and tell him you gotta push back. You gotta push back. You gotta tell the devil, this right here? Are you kidding me? You think this is gonna make me curse God and die? Oh, God's got this. It's already been measured. And it's already been measured. If you think that these light afflictions are going to shut up my praise, I dare you to think again because I am steadfast, unmovable, always up, abounding in the work of God. Why? Because God is good. I said, God is good, and all the time, even when life is bad, God is 
is good even when people are bad when my situation is bad when my circumstances are bad so I will bless the Lord at all and his praise shall continually be open your mouth and loose the praise somebody he's right here right between me and you he's here he's right here a present help in the time of my mouth Hannah said when Hannah wanted a baby and she couldn't get one she got tired of the enemy lying to her and she said my mouth has been in, enlarged against my enemy. You've got to open your big old mouth for a good reason. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, I knew you had a big mouth for a big reason. Open your mouth. corporate that's corporate worship and while we get little blessings when we individually worship when we come together and corporately worship that's when things begin to grow exponentially open your mouth one more time it ever gets in your spirit you can be by yourself and still hear the corporate sound that's what me and Bishop was doing in that doctor's office all we had to hold on to was last Sunday he said expect I looked at him and I said expectation it's what the prophet said to us. We held on. And when that good report came, I told you a while ago, I heard that. Just us, but a corporate sound. A corporate sound that said, I'm going into the high places and I'm pulling things not just for me but for everybody everybody around me look at somebody and say go up into the high places go up into the high places pull down powers pull down principalities pull down sickness pull down curses pull down strongholds Holy 
Spirit, I thank you for power. I thank you for power. Thank you for enlarging our vocabulary. Thank you for enlarging our territory. Tell your neighbor, I'm going up to the high places. If you don't see me next Sunday sitting in the same seat, it's cause I went up to the high places and I gotta pull some things. I may sit over here one week. I may sit over there the next. But if you hinder my praise, I got to leave you because I got to rise up and come away. Woo! instruments and while David taught us that they were important and the people that played them are important as well at the end of the day I thank God for instruments but the first instrument that was ever created was not a keyboard it was not strings it was not bass the first instrument that was ever created was you and me so that's why we must open our mouth because they can't replace our voice here's what I want you to remember and I'm gonna stop because I can go on but I'm gonna stop always remember this a worshiper is one of the few things that God ever sought after. One of the very few things God ever sought after. Look, check the book out. That's why I'm holding it up. Look from cover to cover. You'll discover that there, a worshiper is one of the very few things that God sought after. The second thing I want you to remember 
is that with every acceptable sacrifice, they're not all acceptable. I said they're not all acceptable. Sacrifices went up all over the world today in churches, and they were not all accepted. Why? Because to ascend unto the mountain of the Lord, we need clean hands and a pure heart. Now, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. That doesn't mean that we won't mess up. Even when you mess up, you have to pray that God will see your heart. I, don't, I didn't want to miss you. I didn't want to mess up. But please see my heart. And every time you give God a sacrifice that is acceptable, what, what constitutes an acceptable sacrifice? It's one that we don't have to draw out of you. It's something that you freely give. So if you're going, praise the Lord, because you're tired of hearing somebody say you ought to worship God, you might as well keep that save your energy because it wasn't acceptable anyway. Why? Because we had to pull it out of you. If you got something for me, give it to me. I don't want you over here telling, give it to her, give it to the pastor, give it to her. You can do better than that. Give it to her. No, I don't want it anymore. And God don't either. He wants your worship to flow from your heart. Real worship is bringing your heart to Jesus. Number three, and this is it. Always remember, there has never been a worshiper in this book that God did not deliver. Anchor into that right there and tell the devil, if for no other reason, I'll stand right here and bless his name. I will, I will. Sing your song. Because there's deliverance in your song.